Um, first thing I have to say is that uh, the, the uh, pretty quality of my slides is due to my 13-year-old daughter, not to me. She spruced this thing up at the last minute. And uh, as Carol mentioned, we have a report that's on the website for CEOs for Cities, Paul Jargowski and I, who is a real expert in the national data on, on, uh, on poverty. Let's see if I just click to the right, maybe, huh? Okay. Well, this is my fantasy, right? You know that the President of the United States, States turns to his aide and says, uh, get me everything we have on poor people. We'd love to see that someday, right? Um, but even beyond that, I have a, a further fantasy is, uh, uh, Mr. President, I say, I have um, good news. We can reduce the number of poor people significantly without spending a nickel of the taxpayer's money. And of course, President Obama goes, Todd, this is change I can believe in. Uh, what is it? And I say, all we need to do is change where poor people live. Uh, so that's what I'm going to talk about today, that where poor people live is, can affect uh, their income and their quality of life. Um, uh, let me just see if I can. There's only one presidential candidate, by the way, who's talked directly about uh, the problem of economic segregation. Does anybody know who that is? That's right, John Edwards. He hasn't done so well since then, but I don't think that was because of, of the issue that he raised. And of course, um, President Obama, who's a smart guy, would turn to, my, turn to uh, his aide at that point and say, yeah, but Todd, how do we influence this? And I'd say, the federal government can play a significant role in encouraging economic integration, but most of the action on economic integration is at the local level. Uh, so that's why it's appropriate for an audience like this. So why does, um, <clears throat> why does Place Matter for poor people? I wrote a book called Place Matters, uh, which talks significantly in detail about this, has a thousand footnotes, but I think it's still pretty readable. Uh, talks about the, all the research on how where you live affects your ability to earn income and ability to succeed. Uh, I think I have a feeling I'm preaching to the choir here, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this. We normally think that income influences where we live, right? If we be able to work hard and invest, we can live in a good neighborhood. But it turns out it works the other way as well. Where we live influences our ability to acquire an income. So uh, it's not just, where we live is not just an expression of our preferences, an expression of our success in labor markets. It has its own causal impact. Uh, and also, where we live influences our ability to take income and convert it uh, into a high quality of life or to purchase services uh, on the marketplace. Uh, I could go into detail on this. Once again, I think I'm preaching to the choir. Famous book called The Poor Pay More for Groceries many, many years ago. It's still true. If you live in a neighborhood where you don't have a full service grocery store, you're going to pay more. So there's all sorts of ways in which your purchasing power is affected. It's a very, very interesting set of research. We can start talking about mortgages, right? And uh, reverse redlining and all that's gone on recently with that that were marketed specifically to certain zip codes in certain areas. Uh, and we can also talk about quality of life. Um, <clears throat> uh, the uh, crime victimization rates, um, air quality, and uh, Scott Aller is going to talk about access to, to, to social services. So our ability to have a quality of life independent of our income is influenced by where, where we live, and we certainly care about that. Poverty is not just a question of the amount of resources we have. It's about our ability to function in society, to realize our, to have choices, and to realize our, our dreams, right? It's not just about having money. Um, so. Um, Many poor people live in neighborhoods of concentrated poverty. Po concentrated poverty, the literature generally is about neighborhoods or census tracts where you have 40% plus poverty rates. That is very, very high. And this shows that a high proportion of poor people, people below the poverty level, live in such neighborhoods in many cities around the country. It's still a minority of poor people, by the way, that live in these very concentrated neighborhoods, but it's a significant minority and has a significant impact. And then there's the question of whether living in a uh, a neighborhood of 20 to 40 percent poverty has uh, all sorts of issues as well, and it certainly does. Um, <clears throat> it's also something that uh, affects, because it's not just where you live, but where we live is, is surrounded by a border called municipal boundaries or school district boundaries, right? And much of the poverty concentration that's occurring is occurring within these boundaries. This is a map of, uh, I did a study for Brookings on, on uh, inequality among suburbs, right? And what, I sh what we showed in the study is that the, the, uh, the image of the middle class suburb, right, the Leave it to Beaver suburb is, is fading. We're getting more high income suburbs and very low income suburbs. This is St. Louis and you can see 80, 90, 2000. What we see here is that the red is the under 75 percent uh, per capita income within that place, within that municipality, right? And what we see from 80 to 90, 2000, we see the spread of the red, right? We also see, by the way, the spread of the blue. So you see the spread of the very high income areas and the spread of the very low income areas. 
Um, and th this is what I call the concentrated poverty tax. In the Place Matters book that I co-authored with uh, Peter Dreyer and John Molenkoff, one of the things we do, this is an exercise, this is hypothetical, so uh, let's put uh, a caveat beside this. But research shows that if you take a family that makes $20,000 a year, that lives in a mixed income neighborhood, and move them to a high poverty neighborhood, a 40 percent plus poverty neighborhood, what, if you control for other variables, what would be the effect? The effect would be, on average, a loss of wages of about $3,000 because of access to jobs, another city. Uh, cost of cash and payroll checks, if they had to go to a, uh, uh, um, a payroll instead of a bank, they didn't have a bank nearby, then that would cost them to, just to cash their check. It's like a tax. More expensive groceries, more expensive homeowners insurance, higher property taxes. These are just the things that the literature can quantify, right? There's all sorts of effects that go beyond that in terms of crime victimization and things like that. Um, so, what could we do about this? Well, one thing we could do is what's called inclusionary zoning. Inclusionary zoning means that instead of having zoning laws that exclude apartments or exclude homes on smaller lots, we have inclusionary zones in which we require developers to set aside a certain portion, oh boy, a certain portion, <laughs> I, I, I'm even shocked by how quick it goes, a certain portion for affordable units. And um, you can see that uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, communities across the country that have done this. If we were to do this in the 100 largest metro areas with the 15 percent set aside, we'd create 2.6 million affordable units, a 37 percent reduction in economic segregation, and major impacts on some of the issues I just talked about. So let me talk about right sizing. I've only got, I'm really <laughs> trying hard here. Right sizing as an anti-poverty strategy. Um, here is, uh, obviously inclusionary zoning is not going to work in a weak market area like Detroit. You can't say to developers, we insist you set aside units for affordable, right, if uh, you have a very weak market. And you can see here the, the weak market, St. Louis being number one, in terms of population decline and vacant units. You have a weak market, you're not going to be able to use inclusionary zoning. Here I did a Google, I did uh, Google Maps, which is fun, and I looked, here's, here's our, at the bottom is our hotel, right, where we are, right at the bottom here. And if you go in a little further and look at the neighborhoods, within six, eight, ten blocks of here, this is what they look like. Incredibly low density with all sorts of vacancies and abandonment. This has huge problems beyond concentrated poverty on the quality of people's lives. Um, so what do we do about this? I have to, can I go for another 30, okay, I'll do as quick as I can. Don't, don't tackle me. I'm, uh, uh, you know, small is beautiful, but bigger is better. We always have this idea, grow, 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 right? Well, <clears throat> uh, we can take a shrinking city like a St. Louis or a Detroit, and we can either ignore it, uh, we can fight it, we can try to across the board change it by offering tax incentives and other things, or we can embrace the shrinkage, which I think makes a lot more sense politically realistic in terms of market realism, and um, decommission infrastructure, uh, uh, re-green large parts of the city, you have lots of space here in Detroit, you can create parks and, and bring back nature and uh, relocate to urban villages. So finally, public transit is an anti-poverty strategy. Um, I know that here in the city of Detroit, you just got a $25 million, million dollar Tiger Grant to build a light rail line along Woodward. Uh, and this is, uh, it, and also, you're also, I know you're negotiating for a regional transit agency, which is absolutely crucial. To have the city of Detroit own the agency is ridiculous. You need to have a regional because that's where the jobs are. The retail jobs are out there without a, without a comprehensive. I won't go into the details of this, but we all know that transit is an anti-poverty strategy insofar we have transit-dependent households who rely upon this, right? But the thing I want to point out is that if you build light rail, that the land values around transit stations go up, and that offers you the opportunity, even in a weak market city, to engage in inclusionary zoning. That is to say, you get sort of micro areas with strong markets, and then you can say to developers, you should have a set aside for affordable housing here. That gives people affordable housing and access to jobs. So, uh, <laughs> I'm done, and I'm sorry I went over. Thank you.